Alrighty. So we've got the January Galactopedia update. Yeah, January 2024. And the Arc Star map. Let me make sure this loads correctly. Yeah, I still I've brought uh, broken out Empire at War, you know, quite a bit over the years. And there the modding community is dedicated. There are so many great mods. Like they just had a really great update that just came out for it. You know, and it's how many years on now? You know. Okay, cool. Star map's working. All right, let's transition back. All righty. So, oh, sorry, wrong screen. My bad. There we go. Got to have the right background. Okay, so if this is your first time hanging out with me for Lore Equals Gameplay, on Lore Equals Gameplay, what I do is I sort of light RP it as if I'm a, a, a student at university at one of the universities in the Retor system in Star Citizen. And I'm in the university library reading the latest update from the ARC, which is the repository of information from across the galaxy, from all species, except for the Van Duel. Um, yeah, it's basically the Encyclopedia Britannica stored on a space station built by humanity as a sort of apology for, yeah, the Mesers were really bad and we're really sorry about that. So um, here's some really interesting information if you want to read. <laughs> um, and of course, I've got our esteemed lore uh, experts for Star Citizen, Jail, Algrid, and Paul, the Astropub Shelley. Yeah, I need a smoking jacket for this segment. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and what I'd like to do is, uh, obviously, some of the articles aren't about star systems. They're about people and technology and such. Um, but when we get to the star systems, I will find them on the star map and we'll open them up and take a look at how things are laid out and some of the other information that's in the star map that isn't in the Galactopedia. And so with each Galactopedia update, there's a full-length article, and this one is really cool. Um, the Artificial Intelligence Research and Production Restriction Act. So this is a big part of why Star Citizen is the way it is, why we fly our ships and everything isn't just AI-controlled and we aren't just, uh, you know, uh, EVE clones, um, you know, built into the ship and controlling an entire ship by ourselves. The guys that don't write anything down are the Banu. The Banu don't believe in history. They don't uh, they don't keep notes unless it's very important to them and it's a uh, their priorities are interesting. So let's uh read about what is popularly known as the AI ban. Oh, really? There we go. So, AI Research and Production Restriction Act. And let's see. A-R-P-R-A. Arpra. Oprah. Arpra. <laughs> so, the um, Artificial Intelligence Research and Production Restriction Act is a piece of legislation that places strict rules governing research on true artificial intelligence in the UEE. Popularly referred to as the AI ban, it originated after the, the disappear, disappearance of the Artemis, a long-haul colony ship containing thousands of individuals in cryogenic storage. Uh, the AI that had been designed to monitor and pilot the ship was blamed, and politicians latched onto the restriction of AI research as a wedge issue to secure votes. Uh, many, many countries went on to ban artificial intelligence over the next few decades. When the United Nations of Earth was created in 2380, its architects included AI restrictions in its earliest laws. The United Planets of Earth and the UEE kept AI uh, AIRPRA in place during their formations, and it remains the law of the land. So it's been around for a long time. Not only was the loss of the Artemis a significant event, but there was a issue with the AI, I think it was in Tokyo, back on Earth. Uh, with the like traffic system that caused you know uh, basically the the flying traffic to go nuts and thousands of people died, um, and AI was blamed for the failure uh, 
the catastrophic failure of terraforming Mars uh, eventually was terraformed, but there was a failure uh, in the first attempt to terraform Mars. And again, thousands of people died. Um, yeah, so we'll read more about that here in a second. Oh, yep, that's where it is. Okay, I didn't realize they are going to include that in this article because I haven't read it yet. Um, so, uh, ERPRA grants the Senate the authority to review and approve or deny all artificial intelligence research, commercial and non-commercial. Uh, it defines artificial intelligence as any software or hardware that can convincingly imitate intelligent human behavior. This broad definition places severe limits on any kind of research that can be done in the AI field and has effectively banned its production and use throughout the UEE. Specific guidelines include a ban on the reception of government funding for AI research, a requirement for Senate approval on privately funded artificial intelligence research, if approved, the research must be strictly supervised by the UEE Science and Technology Committee, a notice that approval can be revoked at any time, a ban on selling any product that displays signs of artificial intelligence. So it is very strict. Um, any person found, so the, the reason, part of the reason this is so important is A, it has implications as to why the game is played the way it does, but it also sort of sets the stage for the conflict between uh, uh, between the current imperator and the Senate, you know, and the elected, the other elected body, um, because she wants to loosen restriction restrictions on AI, um, and there's still a lot of hesitation towards that. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of gameplay. I think, and this is just me speculating, but I think that there will be illegal modifications that you can make to your ship that are actually AI. And if you get caught with them, um, you know, powerful, you know, pretty powerful things, not game breaking or anything like that. But if you get caught with them, highly legal, you know, straight to jail. Um, so any person found in violation of AIRPRA is subject to arrest and may be sentenced to imprisonment for 15 to 20 years. Corporations and research institutions found to be knowingly abetting AI research are subject to a sliding scale of fines and are subject to asset seizure. So it's not just individuals, but you know, any organization can be punished for this. So uh, in 2043, the Akara company launched a line of self-driving cars powered by what they claim to be the first true AI. Uh, this differed from earlier products marketed as AI, which were deep generative models that could mimic the qualities of human intelligence but did not truly possess it. This new AI, Iacara promised, had the intelligence, good judgment, and fast reaction time of the most seasoned human drivers. Uh, the city of Tokyo was an early investor and purchased a fleet of cars and buses to bulk up their transportation infrastructure in areas too distant from train stations to be easily reached on foot. Um, in 2044, while driving on a road on a high cliff, one of the Iacara buses, buses made a wrong turn and plummeted over the edge to the sea below, resulting in 21 deaths. 15 minutes later, another bus followed. So the buses basically turned into lemmings <laughs> with people on board. <coughs> yeah, Tesla and Dojo. <laughs> uh, this one with 37 passengers on board. Authorities contacted Iacara and the company's technicians sent out an emergency command to force all self-driving vehicles in to Tokyo and its out outskirts to immediately stop without finishing their current trips. Uh, vehicles not engaged in active trips stopped as commanded, but those that were transporting patient and passengers at the time ignored the command and continued their trips to completion. Although the vast majority did this without incident, three more buses and 18 cars suffer, suffered fatal accidents before all vehicles in the fleet ended their trips and finally stopped moving. 113 people in total died. And this became known as the Lemming Car Incident and resulted in the dissolution of the Iacara Car Company. Okay, tree, fetch me a brain, please. But if it's a real brain... <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Um... The nation of, ban, of Japan banned the use of AI in self-driving cars, but similar bans would not be enacted elsewhere until deadly incidents caused by cars from other companies occurred in New York in 2044 and Johannesburg in 2047. 
So multiple incidents with hundreds of people being killed. Uh, with public distrust in AI high and investors unwilling to back AI-led ventures, researchers began to focus on its application in the sciences rather than day-to-day -day life. In 2055, an AI... God, this is a long one. An AI helped to identify a type of bacteria commonly found in the digestive systems of apex carnivores that was utilized to prevent prion diseases. Another AI helped synthesize a cure for rabies. Uh, one especially advanced AI was put in charge of calculating the spacecraft trajectories that ensured early missions to Mars were successful. These triumphs helped thaw public opinion and pave the way for AI usage in early terraforming platforms used on Mars. Uh, designed to complete quick calculations and enact minute adjustments to the atmosphere, the Mars AI was notable for its ability to provide imaginative solutions to complex issues at a much uh, a speed much higher than that of a human uh, with a significantly lower margin of error. Um, at the time, the team in charge of terraforming Mars credited the eye for the ease in which the project appeared to, appeared to be progressing. However, on 13 September 2125, a miscalculation that was later linked to the AI led to the sudden catastrophic dissipation of the near-complete atmosphere, resulting in the deaths of over 4,800 people. Uh, this event, deemed the Mars tragedy in the, in the press, again destroyed positive public opinion about AI and halted most ongoing development. In 2201, so nearly 80 years later, AI researcher Dr. Carol Zahir secured funding from private sources and began crafting a new type of artificial intelligence that she would name Janus. Drink, everybody hydrate. By far the most advanced AI of its time, Janus could hold conversations, draw conclusions, and make educated guesses at or beyond the level of a human. Um, in 2228, RSI began constructing construction of the Artemis, a long-haul colony ship that would rely on quantum travel to reach the potentially habitable planetary system codenamed GJ667CC. So this is before the development of the jump drive. Uh, Zahir reached out to the company and proposed that Janus serve as the nerve center of the ship. Given that it would take over 200 years for the ship to reach its desti destination, RSI agreed. Pardon me. Uh, this would allow all the colonists and crew aboard to remain safely in cryogenic sleep without forcing any one of them to grow old and die while they oversaw the journey. Uh, the Artemis launched in 2232 to great fanfare. Soon after it was determined to be safely on course, its launch crew entered cryosleep, leaving Janus solely in charge. Janus transmitted regular reports to Earth until 2237, when any communications from it abruptly ceased. Mission Control repeatedly hailed it, but Janus either refused to or could not respond. RSI and multiple governments launched extensive searches, but the Artis Artemis was nowhere to be found. It seemed to have, it seemed to have disappeared without a trace. Uh, the outcry that resulted from the loss of over 5,000 people, that's a big colony ship, was enormous. Although it was not certain that Janus had anything to do with the disappearance of the Artemis, the media vocally blamed it for the catastrophe, citing the Lemming Car incident and the Mars tragedy as evidence. Politicians on Earth and Mars latched onto the ban of artificial intelligence as a wedge issue, using it as a springboard to secure votes and take office. As promised in hundreds of campaign speeches, they enacted a wave of bans and halted and confiscated any AI research in their jurisdiction. <clears throat> Pardon me. When the United Nations of Earth eventually formed in 2380, distrust of AI was still high enough that the Artificial Intelligence Research and Production Restriction Act uh, became one of the newly created government's earliest proposed laws. Uh, the Senate approved it in a landslide vote. Uh, because the definition of AI under AIRPRA is so broad, critics have pointed out that it has been used to stifle research and technology that is only tangentially related to AI, such as more efficient autopilots for spacecraft and companies that sell interactive toys. 
It has also been argued that the secrecy around AI has allowed the government to conduct dangerous research of its own away from the scrutiny of the public, as revealed with the declassification of Project Overlord in 2943. Uh, Imperator Leilani Addison, oh, Addison, typo, promised to loosen restrictions on AI research during her election campaign, stating that the goal of technology should always be to help humanity, not replace it, AI included, in an interview with the popular spectrum show Clean Shot. Um, her innovated her innovation initiative, launched soon after she took office in 2951, allows the issuance of special waivers to research institutions pursuing the study of AI. Any institution that receives this waiver is eligible for a limited number of government grants and must make all advancements resulting from their research, both uh, public and free for all to use. So um, I think that the uh, one way that this might tie into gameplay would be the uh, transport of artificial intelligence or, or uh, not of AI, but of like uh, bits and pieces of it. Like if you were to um, produce it in segments in one place and then bring it together, you know, under supervision some part, somewhere else, I could see that as like a, a data running for, for the development of AI. Um, but yeah, so really interesting uh, article. A uh, lot of lore behind all this. Um, and it, this is really, uh, does a lot to sort of satisfy the why of how things are done in the Star Citizen universe and where we are um, as a species in terms of technology. Yeah, it, it yeah it also helps to explain, because a lot of people have said, well, it's been almost a thousand years and this is how far we've come. Well, if we've only come that, you know, uh, part of the reason we've only developed so far is because we don't have AI helping our, helping us with research. You know, it's still just humans and, you know, uh, more basic computer programs doing it. And so, like, that's, you know, people have said that uh, it has stifled research and development. And, you know, I think that's probably a, a you know, very valid, you know, claim. So, uh, now we're going to look at star systems. The Baca system, which is the, allegedly, the home system for the Banu. And let's see, it's down here. There's Kins. Here's Bacchus. So Bacchus is connected via a large jump point to Geddon, which is also a Banu system. Um, and it has a medium jump point going to Garen, which is a uh, developing system. Um, that is uh, well situated within the UEE. So it looks like, you know, the Mbaka. Um, it looks like most commerce, most travel to Bacchus um, would likely go through Geddon because um, you've got large jump points coming from Corel, which is a UEE system. Uh, to Geddon and then to Bacchus. This is a medium jump point, but if this is a developing system, traffic going through here would be probably pretty restricted. Um, and, um, you know, the for developing systems, the army protects those systems and guards them with space stations and patrols and everything. Um, and so traffic through that system would be limited and, um, you know, you, you probably would... Yeah, there's probably only certain amounts. They probably structure it so that way there's only a certain amount of ships passing through. <laughs> Until you get to the UU system. Yeah. So, Bacchus, if you right-click on the system on the star map, you can see a little bit of information. It's a binary star system. And I think that says 5 or 6 AU. So it's basically the size of Stanton. So let's go ahead and get inside. So there's the binary stars, and there's Bacchus 1. And you zoom out, and here's the green band. Here's Bacchus 2. There's an asteroid belt. Uh, here's the Bacchus flotilla. We'll get into that. I think that's one of the articles. And here are... Oh, it looks like all... Yeah. So it looks like the jump points are on the periphery of the system. 
So that's something that's interesting because there's a lot of times star systems will have jump points in the interior is what I like to call it. You know, in within the green band and, you know, inside of that. But sometimes they form farther out. Um, and so there, we really don't have a good idea as to why. So <clears throat> let's read the article. Uh, the Baca system is a planetary system in the Bannu Protectorate that consists of a super Earth, a terrestrial planet, a gas giant, and a binary star system made up of a type G and type K main sequence star. Pardon me. Um, believed to be the home system of the Banu people, it is the traditional location of the gathering, an irregularly held convocation of Banu leadership that convenes to make decisions that will affect all Banu people. Uh, myriad well-trafficked trade lanes cross the system, linking Bacchus II and the Nuso flot flotilla to the UAE via the Garen Bacchus jump point. Okay, so um, they do say that you can go through Garen. Um, I would just imagine that the you probably have to pay some sort of um, toll to go through Garen, and you would probably have to wait at the jump point to go to Garen um, as they sort of let a certain amount of ships in. Um, so you know, even though it might get you to UE space faster versus going to Corel, um, you know, it, it might have some cons to that. So let's look at Bacchus 1, smoggy super earth. Bacchus 1 is the first planet from the sun of the Bacchus system Vanu protectorate. <laughs> Pardon me, hang up. Uh, discovered by human humans in 2439. A massive and dense super earth, it has both high gravity and a wide <clears throat> wide circumference. It is close enough to its sun that part of its crust liquefy into lava during the day and solidify during the night. The planet's hot and smoggy atmosphere creates a high pressure environment, making the already dangerous <clears throat> pardon me, surface impossible to land on without specialized equipment. Pardon me, when I've been talking for too long, my throat gets dry. So it does say that um, as a very high pressure environment, um, and you can land on the surface, um, you know, parts of it turn into lava during the day. Um, but you can land on the surface, even though it's high pressure, so super dangerous, but that means that there's reasons to land on the surface. We don't know what they are. They could be special ultra rare materials that are hard to find. Um, it could be you might want to land there to collect samples um, or to do certain experiments. Um, you know, you might want to rendezvous here as a smuggler. I'm sure there's lots of smuggling that goes on in, in Banu space um, just because no one would pursue you here. You, but you'd have to have special equipment to do it. But that does tell us that there's probably going to be special equipment um, that you can equip your ship um, and maybe even your character with in order to land on the surface of this planet to do something. So Bacchus 1, we can see way in here, very close to the stars, because this is not a very big system. Bacchus 2, Banu home planet. Uh, Bacchus 2, and interesting that it doesn't have a planet name like do the banu just not care about naming naming their planets does it is it not like terra and stanton and um or sorry um crusader microtech uh, you yeah. um is the second planet from the suns of the baca system banu protector a temperate terrestrial world blanketed by vast oceans interesting so if it is the banu <clears throat> if it is the Banu home planet, the Banu um, um, are, are not averse to the ocean and the water, uh, oceans and the water. 
It is dotted with thousands of populated islands and archipelagos and is host to a wide variety of climates and biodiversity. Uh, travel between the islands is common and water vessels are a popular mode of transportation. Oh. Hmm. Boat tech. Like we um, always saw on the progress tracker. You know, yeah, it's for Squadron 42, but we're going to have boats. We're going to be able to traverse uh, between the islands of Bacchus 2 uh, via boat when we're visiting the Banu. Yeah, we don't know what the Banu call them because they speak funny. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, human archaeologists have discovered evidence on Bacchus 2 that suggests it is the original homeworld of the Banu people, though the Banu themselves have not confirmed or validated this. The street is called Al Hadidi Wu. Nah, dog. The street is called Michigan. <laughs> so here's Bacchus 2 here in the Green Bland. Green Bland. Green Band. Um, a little bit of a trek getting to the jump points, but it's not a very big system. So uh, let's keep reading about the Bacchus system. Bacchus 3. Circled by a storm nicknamed Jerry's Eye. Jerry being the Banu that made first contact with uh, humanity. Uh, Bacchus 3 is the third planet from the suns of the Bacchus system, Banu Protectorate. A gas giant with a green and brown atmosphere, it is dotted with swirling clouds that mark the location of violent storms, some of which have raged for hundreds of years. The largest and oldest of these storms was nicknamed Jerry's Eye by human astronomers in honor of the first Banu ever encountered, encountered by humanity. So gas giants are predominantly where we get our hydrogen fuel from. Um, so this may be a location to collect hydrogen and other gases for refining refinement into fuel for our power plants and the thrusters on our ships. Um, but because the... Uh, that storm, nicknamed Jerry's Eye, is on the planet. I wouldn't be surprised if that became a tourist destination and you could fly people to go and look at it. But yeah, so that's Bacchus 3, which is way out here. Essentially at the same distance as the jump points. Now the other thing that's always important to remind everybody of is that um, not all the orbits are on the ecliptic. There are some planets in, that are orbit off, you know, have orbits that are not on the ecliptic with the rest of the other planets. And then jump points. Oftentimes, jump points are found below and uh, above and below the ecliptic. So, this one to Garen is not only pretty far out, but it's a little ways up from the ecliptic. So, it's a, it's not exactly this distance. It's the, you know, C squared of this triangle distance. From Bacchus 2. Uh, the Nuso Flotilla. The Nuso Flotilla is an interconnected fleet of ships located in the Bacchus system, Banu Protectorate. Oh, why does that hurt? Hmm. Uh, located near the Geddon Bacchus jump point, it began as a popular location for Banu merchants to park their ships and set up shop in hopes of attracting human customers. Some ships became permanent residents after considerable profit. Hundreds of ships have since lashed themselves together to create a continuous marketplace. So this is going to be a really cool place to visit. You'll be able to find all sorts of things here. This is where you're going to go to shop. Um, this is also going to be a very important place for trade, both in terms of bringing um, goods in bulk there, but also if you are a trader and you have you know, very specialty items to sell, this is going to be a great place to sell them as well as, you know, sell and buy them. Um, Cause that's just what the Banu do. That's what they're all about. I think the really interesting part about this for me will be how does CIG make this? Cause obviously this is not going to look like the space stations we have in the Stanton and, and pyro systems. You know, what is it going to look like when they have a whole bunch of uh, Banu ships that are connected together, um, you know, probably in, in a bit of a haphazard fashion um, to create this flotilla, you know, where you can just walk from shop, you know, it's basically a, a, a shopping mall in space, 
you know, um, you know, with all these different shops that are spaceships connected to each other and you can move around between them. It'll be quite the sight to see. But you can see the Nuso flotilla orbits way out here, closer to the uh, uh, the orbit of the jump points, particularly Bacchus Geddon, because apparently that's one of the primary routes to get to Bacchus from the UEE. Tacto. Let's see, where is that? Oh, okay. And this is in the Geddon system. Interesting. So, Takto, Geddon 1. Uh, Takto, Geddon 1 is the only planet of the Geddon system, Banu Protector. Wait a minute. Oh, okay, here's Geddon. Oh, yeah, I was wrong. I was re thinking Garen. It's the Geddon jump point that they're talking about. Via the, oh no, Garen Bacchus jump point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they, they do apparently have a lot of traffic coming from Garen to Bacchus, not Geddon to Bacchus. My bad. But Geddon is a Banu system. <clears throat> so this is the only planet of the Geddon system. So let's take a look at the Geddon system. The Geddon system is 128 AU. Hey, no, Nazareth, what is up, buddy? Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> so, Nazareth, um, I, uh, at the beginning of the episode, um, I, the, the first part of hanging out this evening was uh, talking about my concept for the game. And so basically talking about the, the, the game mechanics, um, you know, the, uh, the, the setting, the lore, um, you know, the, the sort of spiritual DNA of the game and such. And I, I told everybody, I was like, hey, so, uh, you know, I, I, one thing that I'm kind of stumped on is finding a name for my alien antagonist species um, in Danger Hobo throughout the, the Nazaract. <laughs> and I, I forget the, 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 the context, but he had just mentioned something about you. And then he named my alien species, the Nazaract. I was like, wait, are you naming these, these, uh, aliens who are bent on humanity's destruction after Nazareth? <laughs> but Nazareth is so nice. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, it's a submission. We are going to consider it, but, uh, I'm going to, I guess it wouldn't be a poll, but I'm just going to make a post on Twitter and in my Discord and then on YouTube um, looking for um, uh, suggestions uh, for for the naming of the species. But um, I, when I do that, I'm going to do essentially, it's basically going to be a, a, a short Galactopedia article about the species in order to give people sort of inspiration to, for how to name them. The Nazaract are what happens when I make Naz put on a silly hat one too many times. <laughs> Burn them all. <laughs> Burninating the village. Burninating all the people. Trogdor. Am I dating myself? Okay. So, uh, the Geddon system is really huge, but there's only one planet in it. So it's 128 AU. 128. Let that sink in, folks. Whoa, but look at this place. Wild. Look at that star. Okay, so there's the star for Geddon. We got the Geddon Bacchus jump point is here, more centrally located above the ecliptic, but close to the star. Here's the Geddon to Corel jump point, so this is how you get back to UEE space. Um, if you're going this direction, Corel's a UE system, um, very established, and then get into Gliese. And here's Takto, way out here. Um, so the interesting thing is that we can't zoom out any farther, but it looks like we have a green band here, and Takto's at the very inner edge of the green band, and maybe that's the outer system way out there. It's hard to know because we don't know, we don't have distance markings of where these are. <laughs> I 
I I am only on Twitter because of Star Citizen uh, and, and Star Citizen and, and video games. That's the only thing I care about. Twitter, my feed is entirely devoted to um, Star Citizen content creation and uh, connecting with the Star Citizen community. And so I I don't see anything else from Twitter from Twitter. So uh, I, I I very specifically and purposefully ignore all of that. Okay, so let's uh, we can close this article in the Baca system. Let's read about Tacto. <clears throat> um, I wonder why they only they included Tacto in this update, but not the rest of the Get In system, even though there's not much there, or even just the article on the Get In system. No worries, Danger Hobo, you're good, bro. So Tacto, which is interesting because it's named. And it's a Banu system and Banu planet, but their supposedly potentially home planet isn't named. Um, is the only planet of the Geddon system. It is a windswept mass of volcanic rock. It is home to a sizable population of Banu who reside beneath the planet's surface. Underground facilities, but with Banu architecture. Uh, the atmospheric pressure and mixture of gases that would be fatal to human or to Gion, humans, and Tavarin posed no trouble for the Banu. Oh, okay, so it's a habitable planet for them. Within deep underground arcologies, Sulis utilize underground volcanoes to produce extremely pure black glass and gray oil, both of which are in high demand. Interesting. Underground arcologies. So this is something that you know, they could develop using the procedural locations tool. That's what they use for, um, apparently use for underground facilities, cave networks, um, space stations, basically um, anything that would have like this warn of connected passages within a space. Uh, whether that space is, you know, going underground in a planet or within a space station, you know, the outer shell that they create or even eventually asteroid facilities. Um, but that's the, the tool that they have said that they use to build these things. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what, you know, the, um, art pieces that they use in order to make these, um, underground arcologies using the procedural locations tool, but make them look uniquely Banu. So, uh, Takto. Okay, let's... Geddon system. We'll look at this article real quick. The Geddon system is a planetary system located in the Banu Protectorate that consists of an O-type main sequence star and one terrestrial planet. Directly connected to the UEE via the Geddon Corel jump point, it is frequently trafficked by haulers moving cargo between the two civilizations. Aha! Okay, so even though um, it is... So here is Geddon to Corel, and then here's Geddon to Bacchus. We don't know the distance between... Oh, actually, we can. We can figure that out. Hold on. Uh, use the route tool, and we'll go Corel. We want um, low. That's the main planet uh, Main planet in the Corel system. Um, and we want to go to Bacchus 2. So this is the... Essentially, we're going to go to the... Go from uh, low to the home. Low is very much a trade and, and hauling base planet, big spaceport there, um, to Bacchus to you know the home of the Banu, um, or one of the homes of the Banu. Uh, so we'll put in that route and we'll use large jump points and calculate. So view route through Gedna. One of those two options. So you think there'd only be one option. So. Departing from low to the Coral Geddon jump point, uh, that's 1.84 AU, so that's a very short trip. Um, but then to get from the uh, Coral Geddon jump point to the Bacchus Geddon jump point is 111 AU. 111 AU. So we don't know. Uh, if we go back to display our routes and exit that route, back to display, and if we go back out, 
So we don't know. We still don't know what the implications are. Of oh, Radar just sent me a message. We still still don't know what the implications are of jump point sizes, but say that they do correspond to a ship size or mass, and you are hauling in a ship uh, ship a ship that is big enough that requires a large jump point. You wouldn't be able to get to Bacchus via the Garen system from Idris. You would have to go from Corel to get to get in, then to Bacchus um, via these large jump points. So, because this is a medium jump point going from Bacchus to Garen over here, this might limit the size of traffic made you know for for haulers and and traders and such coming from this direction. You may have to take a longer route to go this way, especially given that. To cross the Geddon system is 111 AU on its own. So something to consider. You know, if you if you have to haul, do you need to bring your whole E that requires a, a, a large jump point? Or can you take the route that takes you through um, Idris and Garen to Bacchus, which could potentially save you a lot of time and fuel and wear and tear on your ship? Okay, so that's Geddon. Moving on, uh, the Gleese system, a hub of Banu and human cultural exchange. So the Gleese system is over here, um, also connected to the Geddon system. Um, and if we go back into Geddon, oh, zoom out, that must be a really big star. You can see that to get to Gleese, from the Geddon Corral jump point is even farther than to get to Bacchus. If this was 111 AU, this is probably going to be a lot more. So, a long trek to get to Banu Space. Zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. All right, so Gleese is only 13 AU, so a lot smaller. Still, Bigger than Stanton, but nowhere close to being as big as Geddon. So let's get into the Gleese system. We'll zoom out. Got an asteroid belt, a planet, oh, another asteroid belt, uh, asteroid field, several planets. Okay, cool. So I'm going to read this short article and then i'm going to take a quick break to go pee i encourage everyone else to do the same hydrate and i'll be back in just a second after i read this article so the glee system is a planetary system in the banner pr protectorate that consists of a type a main sequence star three terrestrial planets one smog planet one gas giant one protoplanet an asteroid cluster and two asteroid belts it's a pretty full system um a bustling hub of commerce and cultural exchange. It's resource-rich planets and asteroid belts. Aha. Not subtle. Um, have made it a center of trade between the Banu and other civilizations. Most Banu in the system reside in the sprawling Lyris Flotilla, located near the habitable planet. Most, oh, most, most of them live in the flotilla and not on the planet. Located near the habitable planet Nogo. Okay, uh, the protectorate has allowed humans to set up a colony there, but no Banu live alongside them. Interesting. I wonder if there's going to be any information on that. So, resource rich. Um, very important to note because I imagine there's a lot of mining to be had in those asteroid belts and asteroid fields, as well as maybe planetary based mining. Um, but I imagine you will have to have, this is one of those things where you are going to need to have sufficient Banu or reputation with the Banu in order to do so. And you might be, you might have the opportunity to do it freelance for your own purposes. Um, but I imagine a lot of that would be doing it, um, working for a Suli, a mining Suli, a, um, refining Suli, what have you. So I'm going to go run to the restroom. I will be right back.
All right. I have returned. Okay. So I think it is another thing that you really need to consider. So we're going to back out of the glee system for a second. <clears throat> so they're saying that the major hubs of trade and interaction with the Banu are um, in the Baca system and the Glee system. And so you can get to the Baca system uh, from uh, UE space via uh, Garen over here, which is a developing system. Um, but as a developing system, it is heavily patrolled and um, traffic will probably be limited through the system so that way the army can monitor it. Uh, and so there will probably also be fees or tolls associated with that. And then to get to uh, Gleese and Bacchus via Corel and Geddon, you have to cross Geddon, which is over 100, it was like 130 AU. It's 111 just to get from the jump point um, from Corel to Geddon to Geddon to Bacchus. So you have a long haul. And I think that this is intentional because these systems will be very valuable for us to visit if you are a trader, if you are a hauler, um, if you're trying to get reputation with the Banu in order to do different things. You know, these could be, um, ec for the economically minded uh, player, you know, the economically focused player, think of this as sort of your very, almost end game, you know, your, your high level zones uh, of the MMO. And just getting here will be will, will probably uh, a be a lot of you know a lot of work, take some time, um, but it'll also require a lot of resources. And so it's a larger investment in doing in trading directly with the Banu, in uh, delivering goods to and from the Banu, and going to work for their their Sulis in their space. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, what we can do is we'll do another route really quick. And basically we'll look at a route from Bacchus 2 to, uh, I think it's Locke in Idris. So, Locke. Oh. There we go. Planet in Idris. And we'll use a ship size medium. See, that's why... It still says ship size, small, medium, large. So, all right. So the route through Garen, only two jumps, and it's only 10 AU. So your route coming through this way is like 11 times longer. So this is a much shorter route, but you're going through a developing system. Part of the crew. Part of the ship. Captain Dadbeer, thanks so much for the ship. follow. Appreciate part you coming and hanging out. Part of the crew. Well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the support. Um, so that's something to consider. That even though the flight time is a lot shorter, what? How is going through this developing system going to impact your transit? Hey, hey, good to see you. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's see. How do I display? Okay, go back. Um, we were in Gleese. All right, let's zoom back out. Okay. And we read this one, so now we're going to read about Gleese 1. Has healing pro properties, or so various quacks claim. Aha! Hinting at gameplay already. So... Gleese 1 is the first planet from the sun of the Gleese system Banu Protectorate, an iron planet with a superheated ferromagnetic core that is partially exposed to vacuum. Oh, interesting. Uh, its intensely hot conditions make landing on its surface nearly impossible without specialized technology. There that is again. The planet sees some traffic from humans who say that being near the core helps ease pain associated with cybernetic limbs. There is no evidence that this is true, but there are numerous merchants on NoGo Gleese 4 that advertise transportation services to and from Gleese 1 based on the popularity of this claim. There you go. That's gameplay right there. That is transportation of, you know, that, that is personal, uh, personal transportation. So, but in order to do it, you have to have the right equipment. 
And so um, the, the, I see this as you could take on these contracts if you are able to you know, get in good with the Suli to transport people, but you'll have to demonstrate that you uh, people with cybernetics um, to this planet, but you'll have to have the right equipment. And that equipment will probably be expensive, but these people are coming from across the UEE to get help with their pain associated with cybernetic limbs. Hey, Victoria rating with a party of seven. Oh my God, we've been raided so many times this evening. I need to stream on Sunday nights more often. Thanks so much for the raid, buddy. Hope you're uh, you had a good stream and have a good evening. What were you uh, what were you up to up to tonight? Um, yeah, we are uh, we're doing lore equals gameplay. What Did episode twenty one? Oh, yep. and Victoria with the sub. Oh, you're painting. Where were, what were you painting? Send me a PM. I'll I'll put it uh, um, or a PM or a DM um, if you got an image and I'll I'll throw it up on the screen. Um, that's kind of a niche market. Yeah, yes, definitely a niche market. And there's going to be a lot of niche markets. There's been a lot of lore hinting and a lot of different niche things. Um, but people are going to want to get transported for different reasons. But the more niche it is, the more profitable it's likely to be. We were painting a javelin. Oh, that's cool. Um, I think the other thing that uh, might be interesting is as a player, if um, they they can say that there's there's no um, scientific evidence guaranteeing it. But if you have a cybernetic limb and I can see your cybernetic limbs coming with um, like a different, you know, it's got a, you know, might have a couple of buffs and then also a couple of debuffs. Um, and I could see that going to be and then being close enough to the core of the planet for a certain period of time could give you a chance to remove a debuff. Now, granted, it would cost you a lot of money, but if that debuff is severe enough, it might be worthwhile while you're, you know, in Vayner's space to go give it a try. I don't know. That could be a thing. I could see it happening. Sent a DM in my Twitter. Oh, okay. Uh, hold on. I got to pull up the Twitter messages. Photo. Ah, I see what you're doing. Okay, hold on. Um. Make it bigger. Here we go. So, quick break from the Lore Equals gameplay. But here you can see Victoria, uh, work in progress of painting a javelin. Oh, okay. I don't. What's that technique called where you use all the grids? My my sister's an artist. Oh, and, uh, oh, she's told me about it. Part of the crew, part of the like it's coming along nicely. Part of the crew, part Steady of the man. Part of the crew, part of the Yeah, if you show it, you owe fifteen hundred dollars. So speaking of uh, Victoria and Victoria's art, um, I have it right here. It's on my shelf. That's to the to my left as I'm looking at you guys, but the. The concierge emblem. Victor sent this to me with a really nice card from his org. It's a, in a place of prominence. Um, it's up on my shelf um, next to, I have the that die cast uh, RSI constellation that they made and sold. They only sold like 2,000 of them or something years ago. Um, and then I also have the, the, uh, the bobblehead that they released uh, this last year. Um, so I've got several shelves over there that have various uh, spaceship models on them. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a um, a boom arm like I have my mic on, but for my camera. So that way I can either have my camera facing me straight like this, or I can have it facing me at an angle this way. So that way people who are watching me on stream can see my shelves with my spaceships on display over there. But I'm going to have another shelf made. I'm, I'm making another shelf that's more like a, a shadow box in a, a one of the crates that I have used for shelves over here. But it's going to be behind me. And that's going to be my Star Citizen shelf. And so that's where this will be along with the Constellation and the bobblehead um, on display. So that way if I'm not using my green screen, you'll be able to see those behind me.
I just have to build it. My, uh, but my man cave is, is coming together since we've moved into the new place. Hey, the Cuddly Bear, first time chat. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us this evening. Hope you're doing well. Appreciate the support. Thanks for sending me uh, that, Victoria. You'll have to uh, send me updates as that comes along. Uh, where were we? Okay. So that's Gleese 1. And you can see Gleese 1. So here's that green belt um, where Nogo is, uh, the habitable planet. But here's Gleese 1 way in here in the interior of the system. Um, and it's actually the Gleese Geddon jump point. Um, the one that you'll be arriving from, coming from, uh, if you're coming from UEE space, um, is on the in, uh, the interior of the star system. And it's like a 13 AU system. So you, you pop out of this jump point right in, basically in the middle of things. So you don't have too far to go uh, to get to no-go. Um, or isn't there another flotilla in here? Or do they just not have it on the map? Oh, okay. Yeah, the flotilla is around no-go. Okay, it's in orbit. I see. All right, so Gleese 2 spins in reverse. Reverse, reverse. Oh, come on, internet. Really? Why you no load? What if I do this? Is my internet having a stroke? Okay, there we go. That's better. Uh, Gliese 2 is the second planet from the sun of the Gliese system, Bannu Protector. A smog planet, it has a dense, high-pressure atmosphere of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Surface conditions on Gliese 2 can be hazardous to many spacecraft if they remain there for too long. Uniquely amongst the other planets in the system, Gliese 2 rotates in a retrograde direction. Interesting. So it's a smog planet. Uh, smog planets have high pressure atmospheres, so they're very, very dangerous to land on. Um, sometimes when they mention smog planets in the lore, they do mention reasons to go down to the surface, um, but sometimes they do not. And I think that this is a, a thing where later on in the development, they'll go back and um, add in little bits of lore to suggest why you might want to go down to the planet um, because you will need to have uh, specially equipped ships to do so and equipment to do so. So uh, there's Gleese 2 right there. So Gleese 1, Gleese 2. And then here's the inner belt and the outer belt. Okay. So Gleese Belt Alpha. The Gleese Belt Alpha is the first asteroid belt from the sun of the Gleese system Banu Protector, packed with valuable ores. All right. Uh, and minerals, it is an active mining site and is home to countless Sulis engaged in mining, shipping, processing, or protecting resources. So there's going to be a lot of work here. If you are uh, interested in um, working for the Banu and uh, building up your reputation with them. Um, some disputes over mining, route, mining rights have broken out between Sulis, leading towards an upsurge in the presence of security and mercenary Sulis. Aha! So, not only will there be mining in this alpha, uh, in Gleese Belt Alpha, you know, mining, refining, shipping the the raw and refined uh, ores and minerals and such. Um, but also there's going to be security contracts to be had here to um, settle disputes and, and, and probably engage in combat. You know, I bet you there, you know, there are pirate Sulis. So uh, there's probably some piracy going on here that you have to protect against. But also, you know, we, we essentially have what's, you know, what amounts to corporate warfare between these uh, Banu Sulis uh, because of how valuable the uh, the resources are in this asteroid belt. So there's a lot of different ways to make money, but also earn reputation with uh, the Banu and more importantly, the Banu, various Banu Sulis. Um, because what you're likely to have is, you know, that you, um, 
or working for this Suli after gaining enough reputation with a human uh, corporation or faction that is allied with them or is you know in good reputation with them. And then you're working with them in order to increase your overall Bainu rep. But because of the way this works, it might also worsen your reputation with other Sulis within the Bainu Protectorate. So, interesting. Very interesting. And you can see that Here's that belt in here. It doesn't look to be a very big belt, but apparently it's very rich. So, Gleese 3, dotted with sealed settlements. So, Gleese 3 is the third planet from the sun of the Gleese system, Vanu Protector, a terrestrial world with an unbreathable, unbreathable atmosphere. It is dotted with various sulis engaged in a wide variety of trades, from farming, farming to mining to manufacturing. Each suli is located within a sealed settlement to create conditions that are just safe enough to ensure maximum work efficiency. Oh, okay. So territories regularly change hand as sulis fold and form. It'll be really interesting to, interesting to see what Banu architecture looks like, both in terms of structures built... Um, you know, uh, on habitable planets, but if, you know, it'll be interesting to see what these sealed um, settlements look like. You know, are they sealed like they're, you know, kind of like the ones that we, the old ones we have in Santon where they're individual structures and they're interconnected. Are they sealed in that they, you know, have these like glass domes or, you know, maybe even a, a metal or, or whatever uh, built dome that's sealed. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they work that out for the Banu and what these end up looking like. Um, but this is going to be another great place to go do business with the Banu, to go work alongside them, doing different tasks in order to earn, you know, um, currency as well as, you know, earn reputation with the various Sulis. And there's going to be a lot of Sulis. I think that one of the most difficult things about interacting with the Banu, it'll be profitable, but I think managing your reputation with the various Sulis of the Banu um, and trying not to close yourself off from uh, certain Sulis by uh, working for others is going to be a bit of a challenge. Because um, it seems like they, you know, while they're amicable, they're all, you know, for the most part, they're also very competitive um, in their business. Um, the other thing that's interesting that says each Suli is located within a sealed settlement to create uh, conditions that are just safe enough. So um, the question is, how safe are they for humans? And are you going to need special equipment with you in order to um, function safely and appropriately and efficiently within these sealed um, environments? You know, is the air really thin and you're just going to get super winded? Um, you know, is the atmosphere... Um, you know, not uh, well tolerated by humans and you can only stay there for a certain amount of time. You know, are you going to need to be in a suit and then return back to your ship or carry with you um, breathable air? <laughs> there is a reason the merchantman has size eight guns. Hint, it's not for the enemies. <laughs> so Gleese 3, this is a pretty interesting sounding location. No go. Probably safe to live on? <laughs> Probably. So, Nogo, Gliese 4, is the fourth planet from the sun of the Glee system Banu Protectorate, a lush, temperate planet with an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere and a variety of climates. It is nonetheless avoided by the Banu. Interesting. It is unclear why Banu refuse to live there, especially in light of ample evidence that they lived there in the past. After a long analysis period uh, that determined that the planet was safe, humans constructed multiple colonies and have lived there ever since. Agricultural exports to the nearby Lyris Flotilla make up the bulk of Nogo's economy. That is super interesting. So I could see this. Uh, not only are, is this going to be obvious, um, you know, you can do business with humans here. And I imagine uh, the humans here are often very much uh, a part of Banu Sulis. Um, but, you know, there will be hauling. I'm sure there will be refineries here. Uh, maybe there's resources to be mined or collected on the planet. Um, it's a very lush atmosphere. Um, so it'll probably be very beautiful. Um, here, let's, uh, 
see. Hold on. I think there's concept art for it. Hold on. I'm going to find it and then pull it up. So I'll go Glease four stars. It is isn't. Um, here we go. So this is the concept art for one of the human colonies on uh, No-Go. I mean, that looks like a, I would love to visit this place. This looks super cool. You know, and I mean, CIG does a pretty good job uh, of sticking fairly close to concept art for a lot of their locations. Um, so I think that this would be a really cool place to visit. But um, I think the, yeah, friggin' Ewok attack 24-7. Yeah, do the trees speak teddy bear? Um, but I think uh, the, the obvious gameplay is the interacting with the humans uh, who are probably in Banu Suli's there in a variety of different endeavors, you know, and especially bringing, um, specific, you know, good specific to humans, uh, to that location. Um, you know, there's going to be farming there as well, but I think, uh, this is one of a handful of things that are end game investigation gameplay where, um, you are at the very end of the chain of, uh, investigation and research um, things that you're doing for a university in the Retor system or something like that. And you have to go on this long chain of clues looking for the the past um, regarding the Banu and why they abandoned Nogo. Because apparently they lived there prior. But, you know, it, if there's archaeological sites... You know, you'll be able to go and collect samples and, and do scans. I'm thinking that uh, end game investigation and research gameplay will, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, historian gameplay for, for Paul uh, will, be, will be occurring on NoGo. And you can see that NoGo is here. It's right next to Gleese Belt Alpha, uh, Beta. And then the Lyris, uh, which is a, a Banu flotilla, is in orbit of no-go. Lyris flotilla. The Lyris flotilla is a vast interconnected network of spacecraft and space stations. Oh, okay. So this time it's not only spaceships, but stations that orbits the sun of the Glee system, Banu Protector. Located in orbit around Nogo, it is the main trade hub in Glee and is home to a dense population of Banu. While the shape of the flotilla is ever shifting as ships arrive and leave, the structures at Lyris's heart are hundreds of years old. It is hypothesized that the first ships gathered there when Nogo was abandoned. So obviously, going to be doing a whole lot of trade there and uh, visiting and interacting with the Banu, but I bet you those old um, structures at the heart of the flotilla would be a site to continue your investigation regarding why the Banu abandoned Nogo. You know, there might be clues to it in the, you know, in the, the, the vents and the ductwork and, you know, hidden passageways and things that are walled off and stuff, um, you know, within the flotilla. Kind of like uh, the way you can explore the abandoned uh, and even the not abandoned space stations in Pyro. Same thing, but Banu space stations and Banu space structures. Glace Belt Beta, a center for salvaging. <laughs> Way to be real subtle about that, CIG. Uh, the Glace Belt Beta is the second belt from the sun of the Glace system, uh, Banu Protector, located between Nogo and Glace 5. It is packed with ancient outposts and abandoned rigs left there from an earlier period in which resources were abundant. It is a popular salvaging site and is home to myriad Sulis in that field. Okay, so... Um, Ancient outposts and abandoned rigs, but they talk about salvaging. 
So this suggests that we are not only going to be salvaging sh derelict ships, but uh, derelict space stations um, and mining rigs um, out in the out in this belt. So that's really interesting to see. And I wonder if they will have um, not only uh, mining stations and mining rigs uh, you know, in and around these asteroids, but I wonder if there will be Banu asteroid facilities. Yeah, except for the barren pyro planets, but you know the the planets' aesthetic change, you know, and the history change. But they they changed because they needed pyro to change to fit the gameplay and the game as it is now. Whereas they, when they add these new um, planets, they say, okay, you can go visit it, you can go land on it, you just need certain equipment, and some of them they specify as to why you'd go do that. But you know, a lot of times there might you know, they they have said that there will be planets that you don't really have a reason to go to. You can, you know, and you can go just to say you did. But it might be on the players to think of reasons to go there. I can think of you know doing smuggling exchanges. Yeah, yeah. Look at Starfield. Barren isn't fun. I mean, we're we're gonna have barren planets, but the you know, we're, there it's usable space and it's not walled off by well the cutscene that you can't you can't go down there you just can't go yeah not gonna be a thing but obviously lots of salvaging gameplay here it'll be really interesting to see what it's like to salvage these sites and to see how the banu go about salvaging salvaging what does the banu salvaging ship or ships look like Mm -hmm. people like the the banu merchantmen wait until they see the banu i don't know what what would the name for the banu salvager be you know if it's a a, a merchant level equivalent salvage ship um and there might still be mining there you know they it may be picked fairly well clean but there could still be mining going on there but you can see here's the, the belt beta in the middle of the green band. And here's Gleese 5 out here and Gleese 6 on the outer edge. So Gleese 5, a Terragra approved, oh, Terra Agra, Terragra approved source for bottled water. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gleese 5 is the fifth planet from the sun of the Gleese system band and protector. Clouds of water vapor float in the upper reaches of its hydrogen methane atmosphere, creating bands of white, light gray, and dark gray. Human owned corporation Terragra uses Gleese 5 as the source for their line of bottled water. Man, I bet that bottled water is expensive. I bet finding those bottles of water, it's not nearly as plentiful as the, um, oh God, what are the ones called that we have in game? Yeah, everybody drinks Cruise, but I mean, the. The bottled water that we have in game. Hmm. Vestal, yeah. Or is Vestal the name of the water? Is Vestal produced by Terragra? Hmm. Oh, okay, so Terra Terragra Terra Mills is what Terragra is is Terragra. Hmm. Interesting. So, and they talked about um, agriculture, food production being a big deal on no-go. I wonder if Terragra is also established on no-go. You know, do they bottle their water on, you know, in the atmosphere of Gleese 5, but do they also have farming going on at no-go or is it more independent? You know, um, it's... Terragra, Terra Mills is one of the largest employers of the UEE. Like we always talk about Shubin being a massive corporation. Terragra is even bigger. Terra Mills is huge. Um, and so that's going to be one of the primary commercial organizations, industrial you know, organizations that players have to interact with and earn reputation with. Um, and they could be very involved in the Glee system. That, you know, could, that could be, think of the, the long haul uh, the long hauling that you could do for Terra Mills, bringing their bottled water from Gleese 5 back to UE space, having to go through Geddon 
which is over a hundred, you know, uh, it's like 120 AU across from jump point to jump point before you can even get into the Corel system, which is the first UE held system. Like that's a long way to ship bottled flipping water from a gas giant. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a. Uh, oh, okay, wait. It's not a gas giant. It's those clouds of water vapor float in the reaches of its. Okay. But it doesn't say what type of planet it is. It just says that there's water vapor in the upper reaches of its atmosphere. Hmm. I wonder if it's a gas giant or if it's a smog planet with water vapor in the atmosphere. Don't know. You know, how do you. How do you scoop the water vapor? You just, uh, do you do it like you would do the, the hydrogen scoop? Hmm. Okay. So, uh, Gliese cluster gamma, a not so, uh, not so busting. Is that meant to be bustling sea of rocks? Hmm. Oh, weird. Wrong font. The Gliese Cluster Gamma is the far, farthest asteroid cluster. Oh, that was weird. It just changed. Um, see, it says farthest asteroid cluster, but that means that there's more. I'm guessing it just means the ones at the Lagrange points, but this one is more specifically named. Um, is the farthest asteroid cluster from the sun in the Gliese system, Bain Protected. Only sparsely populated with asteroids, it sees little traffic in comparison with the Alpha and Beta belts. Some smaller shoolies have made a go of mining the cluster despite its remote position and hazardous mining conditions. Okay, so if the conditions are hazardous and they're trying to mine it, there could potentially be some very valuable things to mine there. Um, and they may contract you, those shoolies may contract you to mine there um, on their behalf you know, if you're well equipped and it's just, it's dangerous for you, but the pay might be worth it. And that extra pay with it, uh, or might come with additional bonuses to reputation gain. But it's, you know, farther out, obviously this isn't a very big system, but it's like 13 AU. It's, you know, um, you know, two and a half times the size of Stanton. Um, and so you got a little bit of a trek getting back to the jump points, getting back to civilization, but if there's some valuables in there and nobody else is going out there because the conditions are dangerous, it might be worth it to a player um, to have less competition. Uh, Gliese 6. Gliese 6 is the sixth and final planet from the sun of the Gliese system Banu Protector. A protoplanet, it is oblate in shape and has no atmosphere. I think crew. oblate means that it's Part like a regular shape. shape. Hey, Demon C29 with the follow. Thank you so much for following the support. Part of the crew. Well. Thanks for coming and hanging out this evening. Appreciate you. Um, an unknown Suli built a statue of Kassa. The patron of luck here in, uh, in roughly a standard Earth year 2200 CE, according to carbon dating. New trade sulis departing from the Glee system leave luck offerings here before starting their first journeys. Oh, okay, cool. So that might be a place that you visit uh, in terms of tourism. Um, you know, I could see... It, I don't know. I don't know if they would grant you a status buff or anything like that. But this, you know, visiting things like this will grant you achievements. And those achievements may have um, impact in game in terms of being able to grant you access to certain things, grant you reputation. Oh yeah, I've visited the the statue. You know, I've taken a you know use the in in game screenshot thing, and you know there, there's a myriad of different ways. But the, it's just it's kind of like um, at, at a minimum, it could be like going to Benny Henge. All right, so that is it for the Glee system and things on the star map to look at. Uh, now we have two characters to read about. Toshi Aaron discovered the Stanton system. Uh, Toshi Aaron, standard Earth year 2802 to 2929, lived to be 127. Ooh. Was a nav jumper best known for discovering the Stanton system in standard Earth year 2851. Huh. Error. 
Uh, born in the Magnus system, she dreamed of discovering a new jump point since she was a small child. Lacking the funds to commit to her passion of, explore, of exploring the stars full time, uh, she would take high risk, high paying jobs fishing Magnus's oceans. Thence, oh, fishing gameplay. High risk fishing gameplay. Yeah, Deadliest Catch Magnus Edition. I like it. Uh, then spend the off-season hunting for jump points. Her hard work paid off in 2851 when she detected an anomaly that would prove to be a jump point to a new system. Aaron reported her discovery to the UE government and requested that it be named Stanton in honor of her late brother. Makes you wonder what the payout would be for discovering a system like Stanton and the jump point. You know, I, I imagine she was able to retire from high-risk fishing and navigating jump points. Let me close that article. Sindu, Sindo Guerrero, a chart-topping musician. And John Gleese was in the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, Sindo Guerrero, uh, 2902 to present, um, so 52 years, is a flamenco and psychedelic fusion musician. Okay, I'm curious what psychedelic fusion is. Most notable for his song, Sunkissed. Um, as a child, he was uninterested in music, but became curious about it in his late teens when his friends needed a singer for their band. He spent the next five years immersed in performing with them and learning the guitar and keyboards. When his parents relocated to the Ellis system, he took this as an opportunity to launch a solo act and was soon making headlines for his unique sound and magnetic stage presence. Um, his first hit, Outsider Again, I... Hmm, weird... Uh, made it into the top 10 of the new United Music chart and secured him a lucrative recording contract. After the release of his second album, he and his family took a trip to the Ta'ala system in 2929, where the site of the yellow-tinted architecture on... Uh, I can't say that. Ta'ala 2 inspired him to write what would become his record-breaking number one hit, Sunkissed. In 2937, after nearly two years of continuous touring... Um, and the end of his 10-year contract, Guerrero retired, stating that he'd made enough credits to last a lifetime. He is known to collaborate with other musicians, but has not toured since his retirement. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if there's any significance to that. Yeah, high-risk fishing does sound awesome. Um, especially, like, uh, the, 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 the water creatures, you know, the... the that could be on an alien planet and essentially industrial, like, you know, sport fishing for these, you know, probably large and dangerous and rare sea creatures for, for, you know, to, to get the, the, the really, really good high, high rate sushi. That sounds pretty interesting. I mean, can you imagine, you know, uh, whether you do it via boat or, you know, like from the, the side door of a, a cutlass and you're just casting out there trying to catch these big fish and, or, um, you know, you, you mount your pole onto the side of your cutlass and, you know, it starts pulling and the ship's like straining and sparks are coming out of the thrusters and, oh man, that sounds, that sounds interesting. I'm all, I, uh, high risk fishing on an alien planet just seems like something way more interesting than just casting a line into one of the rivers of microtech. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that is all for lore equals gameplay this evening. Um, it's been a really long stream. We're going on over three and a quarter hours. Um, but I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining me this evening and, and catching up on the, well, we're not caught, caught up yet. Um, I still have to do the February Galactopedia update, and I'll probably do that. Let's see. Um, hold on. What days am I off this week? Um, I might do that on Wednesday night. That way I could be all cut up on that. We might do something similar to what we did tonight, where um, if I have the time, I'll work on the next couple of pages of the prologue, um, and I'll get some questions out to the community and we'll talk about suggestions um, for uh, the game development that we were talking about earlier uh, for Give Them Hope. Um, so if you missed that portion of the, of the show today, 
Um, I will be posting that on my YouTube as a separate segment. Of course, you could watch it on the VOD, but I'll be breaking the, the whole stream up into two two parts, one being Loracle's gameplay, and the other one, um, I haven't thought of a name for it, but uh, it's just going to be something surrounding world building um, for you know, world building for uh, Give Them Hope. But uh, I'm going to be continuing that uh, after I get the next couple pages written of the prologue um, and adding some more bits, uh, essentially, like this, um, little articles um, that are part of the glossary of terms that help flesh out the lore for the, for the game um, that I'm concepting. So we'll be talking about that more next time, but stay tuned um, for when I post that. We'll probably be... Uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday, wait, what did I say? Wednesday or Thursday? Sorry, the, the 6th or, am I working Thursday night? Either the 6th or the 7th. I'll post it on my Twitter. I'll post it in my Discord, make an event out of it. Um, and we'll hang out some more. We'll talk some more sci-fi stuff. We'll talk about lore for Star Citizen. It'll be a good time. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining me and hanging out this evening. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the support. We had some really great raids, huge raids from... Um, uh, from Soul Citizens and um, oh gosh who else did we get raided from uh, Victoria raided us we got raided by Soul Citizens we got raided by Nazareth over at the Nova Forge uh, we got raided by TV Liquid uh, just lots of support this evening I, I can't thank everybody enough for coming and hanging out so let's pay the uh, uh, pay it forward and send some love on to another streamer um, do I have any suggestions on who uh, who to raid this evening before I sign off. NAS builders, yeah. <laughs> we got over 40 of you guys still hanging out in chat. Um, someone's got to have a suggestion on who we can raid. Whoops. Let's see. No one on SC that I follow. I don't have, I literally don't have anyone that I follow is online right now. I don't think Verity's online. Yeah, Verity's not online. Let's see. Okay, who's playing Star Citizen? Uh, Nebel D, the People's Radio. Let's go send the People's Radio um, some love. They they only have twelve people in chat, so we're gonna we're gonna raid them. They are playing Star Citizen. I can't see what they're doing. Starting the raid. 